Hello everyone, one more UPSC civil service examination result has come out and like previous years, many Shangar IS Academy students have cleared the exam. Today we have with us two such winners uh, who are students of Shangar IS Academy and have successfully cleared this year's UPSC civil service examination. We have Mr. Akhil V. Menon who have cleared with All India rank of 66 and Sri Kumar Ravidra Kumar who has cleared with an All India rank of 192. So first and foremost, hearty congratulations to both of you. Thank you. Now, a unique thing about uh, both these aspirants now going to be officers is that they are good friends. Not only good friends, they are roommates also. So they have faced success and failures uh, previously together. So it will be interesting to know how they have faced this journey together and now both of them have successfully cleared the exam. So uh, let's go to Akhil and Sri Kumar. So my first question to all the aspirants who clear the exam. How did you know the results and what was your first reaction after seeing your name on that holy PDF? Um, I knew the result when I was in Alapi as a part of a, a trip because I am part of Kerala Administrative Service. So we were having this trip to Alapi. So we were in a bus. Uh, everyone knew the results were going to come out any time. So everyone ex were expecting at that point of time. So suddenly results came out and I knew that I was 66. So more than anything, I feel that there was a sense of satisfaction at that point of time. I thought that I will be elated, I will be very happy because I was dreaming about this very moment for a long, long time. But contrary to all kinds of expectation, it was that sense of contentment which came in at that point of time. So I think that moment was very special, uh, which I will cherish for a lo lot of long time to come. I know that it's a moment you will not yes, forget, not uh, forget. No, till the end of your life, yeah, I guess. Absolutely. And uh, what about you, Sri Kumar? How did you know this? Uh, usually, I like to be alone when, <laughs> when these results are coming out, whether it is negative or positive, I would like to have in my own mind space. Uh, so, accordingly, I was at my home, uh, was just sitting in our flat and was waiting for the results to come out. Uh, the PDF came out. I was just, uh, usually, I type control F and put in my roll number, but for some reason, I was just scrolling through from page one onwards. And when I did not see my name in the first three pages, I thought, okay, uh, this isn't going to be something very dangerous. Uh, but then my friend was sitting right next to me, so he put uh, in control FA and he put my name and he said that, dude, you got 192. So that moment of him telling me that I was secured a rank itself, just like Akhil mentioned, uh, just gave me a sense of relief and relaxation because that cycle of four years of intense preparation and uh, the understanding that, okay, now it has come to a momentary pause. Uh, was a great feeling and then it was all you know mechanical calling home then you know sharing the pleasantries it's still sinking in to be very honest okay so just one quick question after you uh, knew your result did you check each other's results or how did you know about each other's results absolutely because i don't think that this success would have been sweeter if only one of us would have been would have cleared this examination because this preparation was a very combined effort so um, as, as I knew my result, the immediate thing that I wanted to know was whether he cleared or not. Uh, but uh, suddenly I saw his name as well and he called me up and he said that both of us have cleared. So it was a very happy moment because for us this preparation, this whole journey was a combined journey. So uh, we are very happy that we are in the rank list together. And going to do FC together. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Now let's talk about your preparation journey. Uh, you are a lawyer by profession and yes. you have done your uh, bachelor's in commerce, right? right? So when did you both decide that you wanted to prepare for civil service examination? Where did that thought come that, okay, somewhere down the line, I want to try for this exam? It is a school time, school time dream because uh, even during the school time, I always had this dream that I need to do something which I can relate to in terms of uh, the social commitment that I have. But um, having said that, I did not take any kind of effort during school time and uh, I opted law because I had an interest in law. Uh, but during even law school time, uh, there were different choices which come, comes up during the law school time. Uh, uh, let it be litigation or corporate law for that matter. There were different kinds of choices. But uh, during my fourth year, uh, after having done a lot of corporate internships, I knew that that was not my cup of tea. I wanted to do something different and civil services was an option. And I knew that I had to prepare thoroughly for that, uh, but 
Having said that, again, the college atmosphere, the hostel atmosphere was not very conducive for that. And uh, after I have completed my college in 2018, I started my preparation. So immediately after college, you started yes, the preparation. Yes. But that was not, that's not similar for you, right? No. You worked for a couple of yeah. years and then uh, came to the preparation. So yeah. what was that spark which made you think, feel or understand that, okay, I want to write civil service? Uh, See, my initial passion was not towards civil services per se. Uh, it slowly evolved into civil services because my interest towards uh, international relations, global affairs and diplomacy, uh, right from uh, when I was in 11th or 12th standard, uh, and a wish to pursue a career in diplomacy gave me the idea that you need to clear the civil service examination to become an Indian Foreign Service officer. That was the starting. But then I later I understood that any career in public services is always a great uh, opportunity to serve this country in any possible manner. So that's how it evolved. And while I was working for the, uh, you know, for, for private firms where I was engaged as a tax advisor, uh, I understood that the work which I do over there uh, probably does not give me the same amount of gratification which I would really like to have in my life. So after a period of trying out several things in my life, I understood that, okay, now probably it's time to pause and really pursue what's uh, my heart says, rather than going mechanically by what, you know, things usually come in your way, that's all. Great, great twist to the, you know, yeah. journey of life. Now, success, we have spoken about, you have succeeded, but there were failures. Yeah, absolutely. Both of you failed the first prelims. I think yeah. after the first prelims failure, you both met. Yes. Yes. Then you both together failed the second, first yeah. mains, yeah. right. And now, successful. So, <laughs> how did you face this failure? Because, you know, uh, even now success is sweet. Uh, there are many aspirants who consecutively fail, many UPS, even your friends who attended this year's interview would have failed, you know, the list, the percentage of failure is more than the success percentage. Absolutely. So, how did you fail and how did you both, you were together when you faced failure? So, how did it, you help each other while facing that failure? Um, it was in 2019 that we made our first attempt and we were not able to clear problems at that point of time. Uh, so, the good part about that Failure was that we met because uh, failure was our first point of conversation that we had in common. So we knew that some, somewhere something was wrong in terms of our preparation strategy and preparation plan. So we had to go through uh, the drill properly that is in terms of uh, having a strategy for prelims. That is something that we came up with. But the most excruciating part of failure was the mains failure in our second attempt. Because we thought that our all bases were covered at the point of time and mains was something that we thought was our forte. And we were not able to clear mains. And I still remember the mains result came out on March 23, 2021. And we were devastated. Uh, we both were crying. Uh, at that point of time, next day, we thought that we are going to uh, end this preparation at this point of time and we are going to look, uh, look for some other job. I thought that I will practice um, and he thought that he is going to pursue his higher studies. So that was a plan that was going ahead. But later on, we thought that, you see, we have come this way, this far, as far as our preparation is concerned. And we know that we have enough knowledge base to go through the end of this tunnel. Uh, so we thought that, what if we made some mistakes in terms of preparation? What if we can rectify those mistakes and come up with a better plan? So as far as dealing failures are concerned, uh, I won't say that we handle failure very gracefully. That, is, that won't be a true statement. But later, after a point of time, we were able to rationalize failure and we were able to draw lessons from those failures. And I think it was because of um, the bond that we share that we were able to deal with failure very uh, gracefully uh, after a point of time because uh, we had each other to share our concerns, to share our emotions so that uh, we were not alone in this journey. So I think that is how we dealt failure. Very important, like rationalizing failures and you know moving forward is very, very important. And what about, were you both together when yeah. you and the results came? No, uh, uh, we were apart, but we made a phone call. I still remember that night uh, where we made a phone call and it was full of silence because um, we did not have anything to speak about. But we knew that that silence had a lot of words, a lot of meaning because it was a culmination of a two years effort, which was coming to an end with that failure. Uh, so we had to come up with a plan because um, at that point of time, we did not have a job. And most of our batchmates at that point of time, whether it be in college or whether it be in school, were all settled and we had that pressure to be honest. So at that point of time, we had different thoughts coming to our mind, but because we had both of us preparing together, we were able to again uh, put ourselves back and start this journey over again.
Great. Any thoughts to add? Yeah, uh, well, uh, as they say, grief has different stages. Uh, one of the stages is denial. And I believe that that's the first stage that we went through. When the results came, we were like, UPSC is wrong. We have done our best. Uh, the valuation is wrong. This is not right. Uh, the marks that were awarded to us are not fair. Uh, this was initial reaction. Slowly then we started bargaining with ourselves, which is the next stage in grief. Uh, we started, okay, fine, let's do something better in life. Probably let's skip this. And the last stage is acceptance. And then we probably start making peace with it. And then we decide and, and we do a self-introspection and then decide. We have gone wrong somewhere. Uh, it's not UPSC's issue, it is our issue. We realize that there are some issues in our prep. Uh, let's try it out once more because probably this may not be our best attempt, who knows. Uh, there is still young, uh, you know, there is still, as they say, uh, ek aur jang ladne ke liye jawani hai, toh, yeah. So, let, let the out jeet bhi diya, no? You have won, that's, yeah. that's the thing. Great, then two things like, you, as you said, acceptance and making peace with failure. I yeah. hope that message reciprocates to everyone who has failed at multiple stages. We'll come back to that in the later stage of the interview. Now, let's come to uh, examination process, We're starting with prelims. So prelims has kind of become like, you know, a haphazard way of question framing and nobody can know what is going to come. Even when you sit in the exam hall, you don't know 80% uh, of the questions. You both have cleared, uh, you know, 2021 uh, prelims. So how did you face prelims and what will you advise to those aspirants who are going to face prelims in the coming years? Uh, as far as I am concerned, I feel that the most important prelims that I have attended was in 2019 because that was the prelims that I failed. Uh, and at that point of time, I knew that I committed certain mistakes and it was very common with him as well. Uh, because during the mocks, I used to attend more than 90 questions. But when it came to the prelims hall, because of the prelims frenzy that happens at that point of time, I only attempted 70 questions. And as a result of it, I was two marks short of the cutoff. So later on, when uh, we thought about coming up with a strategy for 2020 prelims, we knew that the pattern is going to change because pattern is uh, undergoing a lot of change for the past few years. We knew that that is going to change. So we had to come up with a strategy which will work for the next two years. So that is how we came up with a strategy of preparation wherein we thought that we will uh, consider that there will be a knowledge base that we will stick with and that knowledge base, base will remain the same. But apart from that, we will master what is called as a logical elimination technique. So over a long period of time, we practiced a lot of questions in such a manner that we had that elimination technique with us. So I think that was the primary part as far as prelims preparation was concerned. Uh, as far as we are concerned, uh, we always used to solve 50 questions per day. That was the first thing that we did after uh, in each morning because we woke up and we solved 50 questions, we used to compare our scores. And we used to fix that time frame also. Just, yes. you know, at so you have done morning. it for a whole year, every day you used to do no, it? No, uh, uh, th four months uh, to prelims or three months to prelims, it was a daily ritual that uh, the first thing in the morning after just getting uh, getting ready, the first thing was just get in front of the computer or in front of the paper, just solve 50 questions and then start your day. Uh, because that golden hour is really crucial to be in the question solving mode. Okay. Yes, I think that is the most important part as far as prelim strategy is concerned. Because um, reading a lot of books uh, and getting a lot of information may not be the way ahead as far as the prelims is concerned, especially seeing the pattern in 2020 as well as 21. Basics are important. Uh, we absolutely admit that basics are important. So once these basic books are done, I feel that we need to go for questions. And that has been our approach and we have st uh, stuck to that approach for most part of our preparation. So solving more and more questions yes. and maybe revising the questions and having an elimination strategy of how to solve questions. Yes, absolutely. You can't and that go and crack prelims with 100% knowledge. Yes. Uh, the, the questions in with which you can uh, resolve with knowledge may be 20, 25 or max to max 30 in every prelims. The rest 70 are something where uh, you use the elimination tactics. Great. Now, when you prepared for prelims, did you make notes? So, aspirants who have just started the preparation will have doubts like, sir, should we make notes from Lakshmi Khan, Spectrum, basic books? NCRT should we make notes. So, did you both make notes or was it uh, directly reading the books? And what about current affairs preparation? Um, as far as basic books are concerned, uh, mostly we stuck to the textbooks itself because uh, making notes from these books uh, may be a very uh, tiring process because most informations which are mentioned in those books are important. But uh, what I did was that uh, when it was nearing prelims, I used to write few information which I used to forget from these books. So that I only need to read these information as far as the final week is concerned. So that I used to do. Apart from that, there was no note making from these standard books. 
As far as current affairs is concerned, I am not a big fan of newspaper reading. Uh, but uh, I won't say that newspaper reading is not very essential as far as preparation is concerned. But it is something which can be substituted with. Uh, so I used to read articles on different issues, different topics which are very important from a mains or prelims angle. That has been done. Uh, and apart from that, uh, current affairs preparation has been basically taken care of by current affairs magazine of different institutes. So that's how it is done. So you read magazines and prepared current affairs. Yes. Right. What about you? Same. Well, uh, the same thing. Uh, with respect to standard books, you don't need to sit and make a separate notebook out of it because that becomes another tiresome journey. And then at the, and, and there's a chance that your notes become fa you know fatter than uh, the actual textbook. Yeah, so yeah. there is it's a wasteful exercise. So we used to feel like that personally. And plus, uh, you know, additionally, uh, I used to read newspapers, but probably towards three or four months before the prelims, newspaper reading becomes a, uh, you know, probably a rare affair. And then that's where the current affairs magazines comes in. Okay, so that's prelims. One one question because prelims is almost uh, near the corner. Yeah. So the last week before prelims, should we solve more question papers or should we revise basic books? A question again, aspirants generally. Probably, uh, I would say that just. Uh, reduce your workload and have a more relaxed mindset and be more uh, you know uh, in a right mind space to attend those 100 questions because uh, we both say that it's like a 2020 match see the ball hit the ball uh, that's what probably you can do in prelims as far as I'm concerned I feel that uh, basic book books have to be revised in this uh, last one week because that is very important uh, even if we see 2021 pattern I would say that the economy questions were all basics and I think these are sitters that we need to take as far as these basic questions are concerned because most aspirants will be able to solve those questions. So basics have to be revised in this past week, uh, last week and in terms of question answer solving I would say that um, attending a mock may not be a very good idea especially in terms of the scores which might come up which can vary. So solving a few questions I think that might be a way ahead. Great. So uh, mixing both Yes. Maybe. Right. Uh, regarding mains, uh, let's come to mains now. Uh, when did you both start answer writing practice? Like first prelims, again first attempt is probably the difficult attempt for most aspirants because you have classes, you have first time studying optional. So time crunch you will feel. Absolutely. So did you ru do answer writing before the prelims or after? Then you failed the prelims. So you got a one year time span before the first mains, for second prelims, first mains. Then again a one year time span before your third problems. So when did you ideally start this uh, answer writing process and when should an aspirant start this process? Um, as, as far as answer writing is concerned, um, the mistake that I committed as far as my preparation journey is concerned, I did not know the demand of this examination. Uh, mains is a very important stage and mains is a stage that can determine your rank. So answer writing is very crucial and I would say that a two to three months in your preparation you can start your answer writing. But I hardly did that uh, even though I had enough resources to come up with answer writing because of the lack of discipline in terms of preparation during the first attempt I did not do that. But it was during the f after the first prelims failure that we came up with an answer writing strategy. We used to regularly write answers and we also used to attempt tests after uh, a week weeks time. So that was the answer writing strategy uh, for us. So I think answer writing strategy is very important. Even during this means uh, we used to do daily answer writing. At least five or six questions per day were attempted each day. And we used to compare our answers as well. So that uh, any kind of value addition or any kind of uh, improvement and innovation in terms of presentation can be incorporated in each other's answer. And that also gives you a practice which will enable you to emulate the same in terms of the examination condition. So I think answer writing is a very crucial uh, aspect of preparation and is a game changer. Anything to add? Yeah, well, uh, with respect to mains, I believe uh, answer writing practice is the key. Uh, and the best part of our preparation was the fact that, just like you mentioned, when you discuss it with each other, uh, you tend to remember the facts and figures that you had quoted in each other's answers in a much more clearer fashion. He might have quoted some reports, uh, some examples, best practices, which he, he would have learned from his uh, coaching uh, preparation stage and I would have probably noticed something else different which would have made my answer a bit different so when we share it with each other uh, we'll never forget the example for, uh, I can quote an instance where this year's mains there was a question on India Africa relations and it was just a few weeks back before the mains that we were just sharing the India Africa and we just shared about the solar mama initiative between India and Africa and because of that particular one instance that we had a conversation we were able to write that point in our answer 
So like that, there were several instances where one of the points of statistics that we shared between ourselves became a really good part. Likewise for ethics, where we share the examples, uh, situational uh, awareness examples which you can write in the answer, the keywords can be shared, which really makes it a worthwhile exercise. Now regarding this answer writing, did you ever go through toppers answer copies and you know uh, get points from them? This is some exercise which some toppers do or people who clear. Have you ever done that going through toppers answer copies? Yes, absolutely. That is something that we have done. Uh, so what we did as an approach was that uh, mostly when it comes to the answer keys which are published by different coaching institutes, that will be a very standard answer which is very well researched as well. So it is not something which is generated from an examination point of view or an examination environment as such. So we used to download copies from institutes like Shankar IAS and we used to um, write the same answer and then compare our answer with the topper's answer. So uh, do, with that exercise we know what is something, what is that which is significant in their answer and how we need to improve to reach up to that level. So that kind of an exercise is very useful. So even uh, I have taken examples um, from uh, many topper's copies so that we could directly uh, replicate that in our answers. So that is an exercise that we used to do. Even diagrams and figures, these are things that we used to regularly take from toppers copy. Uh, definitely, the way that the toppers write is uh, essentially a practical example of how you would do it in an exam hall. Rather than a well-researched, uh, well-substantiated answer, you would probably get a better idea about how you would be able to emulate it in an examination hall. So especially when the previous year toppers ex answer sheets are uploaded by uh, on the uh, coaching websites, especially on Shankar IAS, we download it and we check it out uh, as to which point have they highlighted, uh, what dimensions, uh, what dimensions have they brought into the answer, how good, how crisp is their points, uh, have they written a very broad introduction or conclusion, uh, have they included diagrams which are well, could be emulated in our answers, is it something which we should not be doing it, because not everything needs to be taken, we can also have our own approach to it. Yes. So probably we take one and say, okay, this is not something that is going to work for us both, because it is not fitting into our template. So we discard that and we do something which is absolutely something which is okay by us. So it is more like a hybrid approach where we mix our own techniques, our own strategies and try to see and accept some things which is uh, absolutely possible in the exam hall. Great. Now, regarding current affairs preparation for mains, what differences did you make between prelims current affairs and mains current affairs preparation? Again, was it uh, monthly magazines or you prepared notes for mains current affairs? It is monthly magazines alone, but what we did differently was that there are syllabus pointers as far as mains is concerned, unlike prelims, which is very broad in nature. Um, so we used to compare these syllabus pointers with the current affairs topics and prepare notes accordingly and we will discard all those current affairs which does not fit into the syllabus pattern. So uh, we used to have a broad listing of topics which can come under the syllabus and then prepare current affairs accordingly. It is also a matter of paucity of time as such uh, because we were both engaged at the point of time, we were both busy with our respective jobs. So we only had limited time as far as means preparation was concerned. That is why we came up with this strategy which I feel is very efficient in nature. So as far as means is concerned, means um, does not ask you a very specific question. The questions are more general in nature, which needs you to uh, approach a question in an analytical manner. So I think current affairs has to be um, understood in such a fashion, not in a fashion that is required for prelims. So that is my approach with regard to that. I think with respect to mains, it's very important to have a current affairs which is theme-based analysis. Because for prelims, you do more or less like, uh, you know, catch-all way where you put everything in the basket and you try to look through it. But for mains, you don't need to go through every factual details because for example for GS3, you need to have themes like uh, for example economic development, under economic development, infrastructure, manufacturing or probably service sector. So we divide it by theme wise, banking, regulation. So we put it theme wise and see what are the major developments that has happened. Okay, is there something which we can put it as a good example? Okay, uh, how, which are the latest reports that have come through? Rather than, you know, going around, all around taking random facts and checks, you know, classify it into theme based and connect it with the syllabus, especially with respect to downloading the syllabus pointers and, you know, checking it out and ticking whether have we covered all the syllabus pointers is very crucial, which we, I think we forgot to do it in the second attempt, but we ensured that that was something which was very crucial and which helped us really you know, to improve our marks and GS. My qu next question is actually related to this only, like from second, uh, first mains to second mains, first mains you failed, second mains you both cleared. So what differences did you make in the preparation of first and second mains? Prelims, you already told that you solve more questions. What changes did you make in the mains preparation? In my first mains, that is in 2020, our marks were very similar. Uh, our marks had only a difference of two marks. 
so my GS marks were was around 357 and I knew that it was absolutely inadequate to clear this examination. So the differences that I made uh, was firstly in terms of micromanagement of time for attempting each and every question. So in our first attempt what we did was that uh, for seven questions we used to allocate one hour. The problem with such an approach is that we used to compromise on one or two answers and you, we used to uh, maximize our time for five answers. So that was the problem with that kind of an approach. But in this particular attempt, we used to dedicate equal time for all answers. That is, if it is a 10 marker, it's a seven minute. So after that seven minute is done, we used to go to the next answer. The good thing about this approach is that each and every question is given its due merit. So that has helped us to elevate the score. And secondly, in our first attempt, uh, in terms of all GS answers, we were more focused on objective details. That is, objectivity was given uh, more focus. And what we missed was our own perspective. So our essence was not reflected in the answers that we wrote, which we thought did not make our answers unique. So in our second attempt, when we made a conclusion, we ensured that our perspective, our viewpoint on that particular topic is reflected in such an answer. So that our st answer stands out. So that has helped me to secure 421 marks in GS this time. So that's a very good improvement. So I think that was uh, done through a bit of changes, small changes, but these small changes are very effective in terms of preparation. What about you? Any any like preparation wise changes have you made? Like this answer writing you told, time management and preparation wise also any changes? Will Content minimalism is, some, minimalism is something that we focused upon while in the preparation because rather than going for sources from across uh, this broad spectrum, uh, we used to pick and choose what is really required. Uh, for example, if it is for GS1, World History, we don't need to go and look for all the standard books and try to mug it up uh, because there is a limitation on which UPSC usually asks World History questions. So you just need to have a broad themes, just read up on those and remember the same details. Geography, let's come to geography and let's see that uh, yes, there can be some really uh, challenging questions, technical questions, but the basics needs to be covered. So if that is not going, uh, if that is not done, then your GS preparation is not completely done. And another example would be ethics, where uh, most of us have make a mistake of not including ethical terminologies in our answer, which makes our answer a lot more uh, less authoritative. So uh, trying to understand what are the good ethical terms that needs to be used in an answer, discussing it, understanding the meaning, trying to put it in the answer practically is something that would have helped us really a lot in our GS prep. Now let's discuss about your optional subjects. Uh, you are a lawyer, you studied LLB and took law itself, but you are a commerce graduate and you took uh, PSIR. So anyway, you had your backing as a graduation subject. Why did you move to PSIR after commerce? Uh, well, it was pure interest towards IR that first inspired me to take PS, uh, political science and international relations. But later when I on, uh, went on researching about the subject as such, uh, the syllabus pointers in political science, paper one, which is theory part, really interested me, especially learning about political philosophies, different political philosophies, different political thinkers, was something that really suited my taste, one. Second thing is the guidance that is easily available for this subject across the country, and uh, the content and the kind of materials that is easily available. So that's three major reasons why I shifted to political science. One would be interest, second would be the guidance, and the third would be the accessibility to materials. Now law is an optional which is not very popular among aspirants, only lawyers can take it. And uh, so what will you suggest to those aspirants who are thinking about law as an optional, like the do's and don'ts of law as an optional? Um, nowadays there are people who are from non-law background taking law and excelling in it. So that's there. But um, the problem that we face when it comes to law optional is the lack of guidance. So that is one major issue. And secondly, the syllabus as far as law is concerned is very vast in nature. So I think that is another issue that we need to, uh, that we need to address. So in order to address both of these issues, the first point that we need to keep in mind is that uh, the preparation has to be done according to the demand of the examination. Though the syllabus is vast in nature, the questions tend to get repeated. And there is only so much that you can write for a 10 marker, 15 marker, or 20 marker. So that has to be kept in mind. So rather than studying from uh, starting to the end of a particular book or standard book which is prescribed for law, what is most uh, suited for this examination is studying in a question answer format, especially for law optional. So I think that is a strategy that many uh, can follow, especially when they are having a law background. So that can help them write good answers as well. So that's the strategy that I followed for this attempt, especially because I had paucity of time. So what I did was that I used to write question and answers and then used to revise from that. So any kind of case laws or any kind of additions that I need to make, 
I used to make in that particular answer that I wrote. So that this is something that I can easily revise. And I also had a list of case laws, which are very important as far as law optional is concerned, which I can revise on the day of the examination. So these are something which always sticks in the short term memory. So that has to be revised after each and every point of time. So I, I used to have a list of cases that used to run to 100 or 150 number of cases, but that has to be revised. That is the nature of this optional. So it is a bit of a tricky optional, but it can be safe uh, if it is prepared in the right direction. Right. What all changes did you make between your uh, first mains and second mains regarding law optional? Uh, my marks are not very uh, different when it comes to first and second mains. Even I had a very comfortable uh, above average score in my first mains as well when it comes to law optional. I had a 10 marks improvement this year. Um, so uh, the preparation strategy was not very different, but I gave focus on answer writing this time around because which is not something that I did last time because when you have enough content, you can write answers. But the problem is if you don't have answer writing practice, you don't know what, uh, what is the content that you need to prioritize as far as your optional answer writing is concerned because it's a different ball game when it comes to GS answer writing and optional answer writing. You need to write as an expert. Um, so uh, during my answer writing strategy, I evolved a pattern wherein what my introduction will be and where, where will I fit in case laws and statutes regarding a particular questions that will be asked and what is the kind of conclusion that I need to come up with. So having a contemporary uh, issue that is coming up in conclusion that can help you boost your marks, especially in law. So these are little bit of changes that I made uh, in this attempt and I think which has worked for me as well. Great. Now PSI are the do's and don'ts. What all will you suggest? Right. Uh, sticking to the syllabus and having a conceptual clarity is really crucial because most of them were one of the, let's start with the don'ts before we go to the do's. Uh, the don'ts is that first one is to go behind a lot of materials. Uh, yes, there are several uh, books available for political science. There are a lot of uh, authors who write political science of, notebooks but covering all of them is not possible so most of the content which the aspirants write is the same the only way where you can make a difference in your answers is by quoting the right author the right name the right thinker and under uh, and ensuring that the keywords the key concepts are visible to the evaluator that is one thing and structuring your answer so the if, one thing would, that you shouldn't be doing is that second thing is not doing enough answer writing practice because for any uh, optionals, especially political science, requires a lot of writing practice and understanding and putting uh, the, your thoughts in a really, really uh, con uh, concise manner. The third one would be to uh, uh, ignoring the second paper, which is the international relations paper. Many of them focus solely on the first paper, which is a theory part where they have set syllabus. Second paper is a bit tricky where you have international relations dynamic concepts, especially this year they asked about uh, very factual questions like what were India's commitments at the COP26. So those are things which are straight out of current affairs and something or sort of a GS question. So those questions also need to be given due focus and you need to prepare and understand what is happening around the world in geopolitical with geopolitical significance. Make your own notes about it and have a really good understanding of these things. So uh, one thing would be the presentation of answers. I would say that my in my first attempt, though I had uh, above average marks in my first attempt, I wouldn't say that my answers were really presentable. Most of them were clumps and was not presented well. Second, uh, in, this, my, in, in this attempt, I gave more focus on having a more uh, concise manner to my answers. Second would be time management. I used to spend a lot of time on 10 markers and spend very less time on 15 and 20 markers. So a role reversal where 10 markers are uh, given due attention, but sticking to that 6.57 minutes and finishing of those section was one change I made. Now let's move to the interview uh, phase, which is one of the most anticipated phase by any aspirant. So this was your first interview, right? Both of you went uh, for the first interview. So let's share your interview experience. Was it like really in the expected way? Because we attended a lot of mocks and we get feedbacks from the mocks. But when you go and sit in that room, the experience is totally different. It's what I have felt. You no, know, initially I went blank and then I gathered all my wits and started answering. So how was your experience sitting in the actual UPSC interview room? Uh, I think the actual interview is a different ball game when it come, when it compares to the mocks that we attend. Uh, I think when it comes to mocks, there is a lot of diversity in terms of the questions that uh, that is posed to us. I think they test us on different kind of subjects. But when it comes to UPSC interview, uh, it depends on that particular day. What is the kind of questions that they want to ask on that particular day? For me, it was a very cordial experience because the board was very uh, forthcoming and very warm uh, in terms of 
the questions that they posed and in terms of the time that they gave me in terms of giving answers for that. However, the questions were only from a limited topics, especially in terms of constitutional law. That is the area where I got most of the questions from. Uh, I had to an answer a few controversial questions like the Shabrimala issue, the hijab issue, uh, how I consider the genital mutilation that happens in the Dawudi Bora community. Uh, these are issues which are subsidized in nature, but uh, questions were posed from that. And apart from that, there were few questions related to insolvency and bankruptcy code and company law, which are all related to my graduation subjects. So, um, I would say that um, only topic which was asked was law and none of the other topics from DAF were even touched upon by the interview panel. So, it's a different ball game, it's a different experience, but it's a very good one. A great. Which board did you get and what is the score this year? Uh, my board was Spita Nagraj ma'am and I got a score of around 185. Great, great. It's a great score. Now, if you I don't know if you remember the answers, but what was your answer for the Shabrimala? What was the question? What did you answer? Do you remember the hijab question issue and all? Uh, when it comes to the Shabrimala issue, uh, my stand on that issue is obviously asked. And uh, I said that the stand should be one which is very constitutionally sound in nature. As it is a subsidized issue, I uh, made a comment that it is subsidized in nature, but still I gave my opinion on an academic note. I said that uh, the entry is uh, something which is restricted on the grounds of uh, the biological nature of women and that has to go away because of um, Article 14 and many other rights which are conceived by the constitution itself and no religious right should um, come in conflict with the right to live with dignity as such and that has to be ensured for each and everyone in this country and without any kind of discrimination as far as gender is concerned. And even in terms of hijab issue, I made a balance stand, though I knew that the Karnataka High Court decision was uh, upholding the ban, uh, I made a comment which uh, stated that that should have been reasonably accommodated. Uh, though uniform is absolutely necessary in terms of school premises, I said that because it can impact the school education of Muslim girl children, what has to be done is reasonable accommodation of that price and gradually coming up with a social engineering strategy wherein um, something which is not conducive like hijab can be gradually phased out. But an abrupt uh, change was not recommended from my part and I think the board was kind enough to accept that. Great. Any other questions, interesting questions which you remember immediately, any funny questions or any moments uh, you had a, like you know, soft moments with the board? Uh, anything? I did not have any soft moments as such but one question which I remember precisely was the constitutional history of India. Uh, what are the highs and lows of constitution? W this was one question which was asked. So when it comes to highs, there are obviously this instance of public interest litigation, Keshavananda Bharati case, basic structure doctrine, which all comes to the, which comes to the mind of any UPSC aspirant. But when it comes to the law of the constitution as such, I say that it is the emergency era. I think uh, that was a very good moment as far as the interview is concerned, because I was able to effectively uh, substantiate why the emergency era has to be uh, the black moment or the low moment of the constitution as such. Great, great. So you had a good feel when you came out of the interview? Uh, Not a great feel because my interview was uh, limited in terms of the time it took. It was 20 to 25 minutes. Uh, so I thought that if it was a bit more longer, I could have said a uh, lot more things. But that is how the nature of UPSC interview is, something that is not in your control and you only control the controllables. Great. And what about you? My interview was really different, as he said, from the mocks because I expected a lot of questions from my DAF personally, with, resp uh, with uh, especially with respect to my service preference, uh, with respect to the hobbies that I had mentioned and everything, uh, because I had a quite of a lot of uh, quite a uh, number uh, one or two hobbies which were probably not so much seen in a DAF. So I thought I would probably get a lot more questions on those things. Uh, however, the board seemed to be interested to be asking more questions on my graduation topic. Uh, which was commerce and they asked me a lot more questions surrounding GST, Finance Commission, FRBM, uh, uh, about the manufacturing industry in India, about how uh, nuclear energy can be more, made more safer, about the Russia-Ukraine conflict. One question was from IR, though I had expected a lot more. Uh, it was more on the factual basis. I was also asked a few bouncers like, uh, where was the next Commonwealth Games happening, where was the next Asian Games happening, which I did not know the answer to. And probably he asked me about, uh, one of the members asked me about whether the 2022 World Cup is happening, which I happen to know because I had studied in Qatar for around 12 years. 
so these were some of the questions which were asked to me. Uh, highly factual in nature would say probably four or five analytical questions. But uh, there was a moment in the interview when the interview panel had, uh, I, my panel was headed by Arun Chaubey sir. Uh, Chaubey sir had asked me whether he wanted to, uh, whether I wanted to share something with the board apart from all of these questions after they had finished. Uh, for when, and I told the board that uh, I would want to thank my mother and my father and my grandfather who was uh, the pillars of strength behind my, uh, behind my all my preparation journey, uh, which, I, which I felt that the board seemed to like rather than me telling out all my daff in front of them and saying that, okay, I do this, I do that and blah, 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 uh, which were probably one of the soft moments. And one of the goof ups that I made in the interview was uh, the panel asked me to name a few nuclear accidents. Uh, in nuclear disasters in the world and uh, me coming from a, a political science background there was an author whose name is Francis Fukuyama yes. and uh, instead of saying Fukushima I said Fukuyama okay. and he said you mean Fukushima and they had a slight okay uh, okay, <laughs> okay. Uh, apart from that the interview board was really cordial Chobe sir especially is known for making that board really uh, you know the environment really cordial yeah. Well, yeah what about the scores was did you get the scores you were expecting or like uh, on that front, I'm a bit disappointed because I expected a little more, uh, probably somewhere in the one eight, late one, uh, you know, lateral half of the one eighties. However, I, you know, the interview score of this year was around one seventy seven. Okay, reasonably good score only, but yeah, you can you you expected more, yeah, exactly. right? Now let's do something light, uh, you know. Uh, let's let's make it a bit lighter. We'll do something like a rapid fire. Okay, I'll ask you small questions. You can answer very uh, you know quickly don't think too much whatever comes to your mind most of these are yes no questions you can answer yes or no so first question uh, the subject you like the most in the entire preparation and i hope you won't be diplomatic hmm. polity international relations the subject you hated the most geography economics one officer that inspired you in the uh, you know in the services uh, prashant nair is prashant nair is at least now it's yes or no questions. You can answer yes or no. Uh, I think the first question you already answered before, but still I'll ask. At least once in the journey, I felt that making uh, preparing for UPSC was not a right career decision. After my means failure. After my first prelims failure, yes. Prelims failure, okay. At least once I have thought about changing my optional. After my means failure. Same here, we both discussed it over the phone. Shall we shift the <laughs> optionals? Because before even coming the months, we thought we lost the means because of our optionals. But our but option was not the villain. Option was not the villain because... So you have had, these are all thoughts which go through aspirants' minds, yeah. basically. I stayed away from social media to avoid friends and their stories. Yes, absolutely. For five years at least. So you were away from social media for five years, okay. One of the inspirations for writing the exam was the fame that we will get after the results. Not really. One of the things you never imagined that One of the probably is. One of the reasons, yes, absolutely. The, the day where the newspaper yes, is. Yes, probably is, probably is. I have skipped NCRTs. No. Yes. News, another question was regarding newspaper, but you told that uh, you are not fans of newspapers, so obviously you have skipped newspapers, right. I have created hobbies to add to the DAF. No. No. Right. Now, uh, last question. At least one person have told me that you should not do UPSC. Yes. Yes. So, how did you overcome that? See, generally when people start, you know, said, why are you, you are a lawyer? Why can't you pursue law, commerce, CS, CA? Why don't you do that? So, how did you uh, reply to that? How did you overcome that? Because uh, when it comes to uh, these kind of questions, always uh, this can create a amount of self-doubt. Especially when you're going through such a rough phase. Mm -hmm. When someone asks you this question, why, why are you not pursuing law and why are you going for civil service? Which is very uncertain in nature. And uh, then you question yourself, are you having that enough in you in order to clear this examination? You have those kinds of self-doubts. But what you need to do is that you need to go back to why you started, why you started this journey and what is that thing which always used to push you. And I used to go back to that and then I gather enough courage to go through this process of examination. At the end of the day, if you question yourself, you can't clear this examination. And it is very important to trust yourself and trust your strengths and understand your weakness as well. Great, great. Uh, apart from whatever he said, I think very simple thing, just smile at them and be like, probably I'm doing something which suits my mind, my peace. So probably I just go with it. No, no offense, but probably have a smile at them and just go and do, uh, you know, carry on with your own work. Probably the, your efforts and your results will be an answer to them. 
and you have proved it right now. And one question I want to ask, there are subjects which are like a personal favorites of aspirants, subjects people find it difficult to prepare rather than the word hate. How do you deal with those subjects which you find more difficult, do you feel bored reading, how do you deal with those subjects? Because my, that subject was geography, because I did not understand geography per se. So what I did was that I used to listen to geography lectures very keenly so that I understand at least the basics of that. So I only learn the basics of that, I don't go deep into it. And then I also make certain cosmetic uh, arrangements when it comes to presenting my answers, when it comes to geography, I used to draw maps. Even though I'm not very uh, well versed with where are these countries placed, where are these channels placed, I'm not very sure of it. But I draw a map which suits all these requirements. So that is something that I used to do. But I don't used to study these subjects in a very deep manner because the cost benefit is very low. Even in terms of my prelims preparation, my uh, geography knowledge would be in such a manner that the questions that everyone would mark right, I would also mark right. But I won't go that extra mile in order to get those questions which a very good uh, a person who is very uh, has a, having an expertise in geography would attempt. So I would ignore that and probably I would maximize my score in a subject like polity or economics for that matter. Economics for you? Uh, I'm a commerce graduate, so I shouldn't be telling this, but uh, weirdly enough, uh, some, there is something about economy that probably gives me a lot more of a dry feeling, probably because of that. And I'm more fascinated towards IR, maybe because of that. But one way I deal with a difficult subject is to spend more time with the difficult subject. As I say, uh, when the going gets tough, the tough gets going. So I probably spend more time with the tough subject, uh, spend enough amount of time to understand why is it, uh, why things are happening the way it is. Uh, watching YouTube videos to make this uh, concepts much more simpler, trying to have my own mind maps or diagrams over things that probably will help you understand better, trying to write and more practice more answers. And as he said, if you get very really, really technical questions for in the prelims, very conceptual, we will attend it. But if it's something that is beyond my comprehension, I will probably skip it. Great, great thoughts. Now, you, now let's discuss some few things in general before we end the interview. Like UPSC preparation is a long journey. We have been into the cycle for almost four years finally have uh, succeeded. So how did you deal with stress in the entire preparation process? Obviously I know friends supporting each other is a great uh, relief and you told how you faced uh, failures together. Apart from that, how did you deal with stress? I mainly want to know about your hobbies. You told you had uh, a couple of hobbies you wrote in the DAF. Did you get time to pursue all these hobbies while preparing? How did you deal with stress? Um, I would say that stress is not something that I managed really well because I was a person who used to be consumed by stress even during the examination process itself. So that used to happen but what I did was that um, I have managed my response towards stress. Stress happens every time uh, even during the last things it has happened uh, in a huge manner but I managed my response towards stress. That um, So uh, when it comes to my mains examination or when it comes to my prelims examination in general. Uh, in 2019, uh, the night before prelims, I was not able to sleep because of uh, anxiety. Because the next day I am going to write my first prelims and it's a very important examination in my life. I knew that. Um, so I was not able to sleep and the next day, it reflected in my prelims attempt. It was not uh, the sleep deprived person uh, that created a huge trouble for me. But it was that thought that I missed sleep which created that kind of a trouble. So later on, when I gave my next attempt, uh, even in 2020, I knew that I may not be able to sleep. What I did was that even before that prelims examination, I created such an atmosphere or environment wherein I am not getting so much sleep and I am still attempting a mock test. So I did that. I emulated that. So during that examination point of time when in 2020, when I did not get a lot of sleep, still I was able to clock 120 marks in prelims because I knew that it is a factor that I can manage. And I also had this... Uh, a wonderful story coming from Sachin Tendulkar wherein he was saying that even while he was playing one of his greatest innings, uh, he had nights wherein he was not able to sleep because thinking about next day's performance. So that happens. And apart from that, I also used to pursue meditation in order to manage my stress levels. And we used to go out for movies. Like uh, we did not have a schedule wherein we used to study 24 into 7. We used to plan our movies together. We used to go for movies Saturday night. And we also used to play badminton regularly. So these are things that we used to do, uh, which were part of our timetable itself. Because we knew that if it is only preparation, um, we, can, we can be consumed by preparation itself and this will suddenly come to an end. But we, need to we needed to have that balanced lifestyle and we need to take everything in moderation, we knew that. And that was um, put as a part of our timetable, that's how we dealt with it.
Great. I think understanding stress and you know uh, keeping it aside and yes. dealing with it is something which you worked on. Yes. Thought about you. Well, uh, as he said, we are not good managers of stress. Okay. Uh, <laughs> we have our points where uh, stress consumes us. Uh, but I believe that the way in which we deal with the stress have changed over the time. And me personally, uh, my greatest stress buster is food. Uh, whether food. you're really happy or whether you're really sad, food is something that really is a, okay. more like a therapy so for you're me. A of course, uh, <laughs> quite, visible. quite visibly, <laughs> okay. uh, of course. Uh, so definitely that's one of these things. And secondly, uh, as you asked me, do I get my time to follow my hobbies? One of my hobbies is cooking. So definitely I make sure that uh, to suit my taste buds, I spend time in the kitchen so that my stress is also being busted over there. Secondly, watching Formula 1 races is one of my favorite hobbies. Every Sunday night we have races. So I watch races, get my, ensure that my dose of, daily dose of my, uh, you know, entertainment is solved over there. There's one way to deal with that the usual preparation stress. When it comes to examination, maybe you may not be able to do all of these things. But as he said, uh, going and playing a few rounds of badminton on the court or uh, having, watching a few movies really helps a lot. Great. Now, three mistakes you feel you have done in the preparation. Or retrospectively, these three things you would not have done. Now looking yeah. back. Um, believing in certain dogmas, especially in newspaper reading during the first part of my preparation. Because when I used to read, uh, when I used to uh, miss one newspaper or two newspaper, I used to feel that this is the end of my preparation. So that kind of believing in dogmas, that is one thing. Secondly, not understanding the requirement of examination and studying everything and anything that came my way. Just to make it more clear, understanding the requirement of the examination? Uh, when it comes to preparing a subject like modern history, what you need to do is that you need to know what is asked for prelims. You don't need to read two or three books. You don't need to read Bibin Chandra, then go for spectrum. That is not what these examination demands. You just need to stick to one book and maybe solve a lot of questions. That is what is the approach that is needed for the examination. But I used to read from different sources. Uh, then I don't make notes from that. So it's a haphazard preparation. So understand, not understanding the demand or the requirement of this examination, that is one part which... So basically understanding, understanding the questions of UPSC. UPSC. Yes, oh, understanding because. the questions of UPSC, the trends and patterns, that is very important. And thirdly, ignoring answer writing during the first phase of my preparation, which I feel um, would have at least saved one of my attempts. Because if I have started answer writing from my first attempt, probably by second attempt, I would have had a crystal clear clarity with respect to how or what kind of a template that I would have used for answer writing. But I think it was, I was a late starter when it came to answer writing. Okay, so now I think all the aspirants who are listening to it can correct all those yeah. things while they're preparing. What about you? Uh, during my first phase of preparation, I don't think I used to follow a disciplined pattern, uh, which led to the failure in first prelims, I believe. Uh, not having a regular sleep pattern, uh, disrupted sleep pattern, waking up or at odd hours in the night, staying too much late, not having four to five, bare minimum three to four hours of sleep. I don't think that works, uh, shouldn't be done, which I solved it at a later phase. Secondly, would be not practicing enough mock papers uh, and not finding an optimum attendance level, in, especially in prelims, which, which will cost you very dearly if you are going for a prelims like that. Third one, uh, I'm, I thought that I'm not, a, I'm, a, I'm not a person who is really excelling in CSAT. I failed my first CSAT examination uh, because I did not give much attention to my first CSAT examination. But later on, I understood that if you don't practice CSAT and take it for granted, it really can spoil your chances. Okay. So okay. I think these three things, with very specific to prelims, I would say. Rest of them, whatever he did is also, as we went through the similar phases, these are mistakes which have been committed by me as well. All right, all right. Right. Now you are both good friends. Imagine today you are meeting Sri Kumar, who failed his first prelims. You have cleared it and you are meeting Sri Kumar, who has failed his first prelims. What advice will you give to Sri Kumar? I would say that you are much better than the results and you will anyway clear prelims examination in your next attempt. Uh, so that will be the kind of advice that I will give him. Because I feel that when someone fails prelims, what he needs is a kind of validation from someone else. Because I have received from that few people, uh, that from few people, so that's the reason why I was able to give my second attempt. So rather than giving you a minutest details with respect to your preparation, you need someone to put your uh, put an arm around your shoulder and tell you that it's okay. There is next at attempt coming up, and you will clear. And that's what about you? You are meeting Nagil, mm. who failed in his first prelims. Mm. You have cleared the exam. And what will you tell him? Okay, uh, nice question. <laughs> well. Uh, the first thing that I would like to say is that 
see a UPAC results, whatever it is, uh, whether you have cleared the examination or not, is never a, an indication of your intellectual ability. Uh, just because, it, let's say, in reality, even though we have cleared it, we can't claim ourselves as the most intellectual people in the country or the 600 and odd candidates who have been elected. It's just that things have gone right for them probably in this point of time. Maybe all the others might be deserving them probably this year, but their time will come probably where they will hit it. So a sense of vote of confidence that, uh, as he said, this is something that will be achieved by you sooner or later and just work towards it with a happy and relaxed mindset is something that I would like to say. I think one of the best parts of the entire interview is that you both are totally honest, upright and you know, telling things very truly, which rarely happens. I'm, I'm happy about that. Now, Shangrai's Academy is happy to be a part of your success journey and uh, you know, it's a privilege that we could help you out in this entire process of clearing the exam and we would like to hear your experiences with Shangrai's Academy. Uh, especially in terms of the materials that I've used. I've used materials when it comes to medieval history, environment when it comes to Shangrai A's. And even the current affairs material for that matter, the environment materials are absolutely, uh, uh, absolutely of high standard when it comes to uh, Shangrai A's. And uh, when it comes to my own preparation journey, I would say that the support that was extended by Lina Ma'am from Shangrai A's Academy has been spectacular because I would say that there was a personal touch in each and every kind of steps that she took when it comes to my preparation. Because she personally arranged uh, different kinds of sessions for me when it when it came to her notice that I was lacking in terms of preparation on this particular subject, especially on the interview phase, because I was telling her I was not getting enough time when it comes to interview preparation, because I had to balance it out with my KS training, which is a state civil service in Kerala. So uh, she told me that you don't need to worry about that. Uh, I will arrange some sessions for you. So that was taken care of by her. So I did not have to put a lot of stress in terms of my interview preparation, because I had that support system from Shankarai's Academy and especially I need to give a huge thanks to Lina Ma'am for that. It's always our pleasure to help you out. Yeah, with respect to prelims, I believe uh, Shankarai is an integral part of it. I think prelims preparation, especially Shankarai's environment textbook is something most of the aspirants really refer to when it's coming to environment studies. Second thing is, uh, uh, soon after prelims is over, we all refer to the Shankar cutoff prediction and the Shankar keys because I think it's one of the most vetted ones and yes, one absolutely. of the most, uh, you know, credible ones which most of the aspirants will refer to uh, rather than a lot of other things. And with respect to interview, especially in Rwanda, uh, where I was attending uh, interview one on ones, uh, even though I had a very few time, uh, you know, time limit before my actual interview, within that particular time period, Lina Ma'am was really kind enough to arrange three to four one on ones within that very specific period of time and. I think her key remarkable feature is that she is very cordial to anyone who comes and just uh, asks you personally, is there something that we can do for you? Uh, now, I don't know how many of them will really take, take a time out of their personal schedule and do that for you and go that extra mile. And with that respect, I believe it's a wonderful job done and making this job, making this journey much more easier has been, you know, done over there. So, yeah, th big thanks. Great, great. Again, as I said, Lena Ma'am is the branch head of our Trandrum Shangrai's Academy and a big shout out to her to all the help extended to all the candidates. Now, because we have discussing about, I wanted to ask about KS because it's UPSC, like what a difference you felt uh, between the preparation of KS and uh, civil service because you have cleared both now. Yes. So, uh, are, is the preparation similar or like what differences? I would say that there is a difference uh, when it comes to the approach that is to be taken. The prelims, I won't say that there is a huge lot of difference. KS is more factual in nature, so you need to have more factual information uh, when it comes to clearing KS prelims, so that is there. But uh, when it comes to the main stage, there is a difference. That is, the space that is given when it comes to each and every question is very limited in KS, and the questions are also asked in a factual manner. So objectivity is very key when it comes to writing answers. But that is not the case with civil service mains examination because you have a space uh, which is given wherein you can write any kind of an answer. And uh, you are given 10 markers and 15 markers and 20 markers wherein you can express your creativity and ideas. So you need to bring in that perspective of your own when it comes to writing answers for civil services means. So that is a kind of difference when it comes to both these examinations and interview pattern I would say that it is very similar. Great. Now last couple of questions. Uh, the advice you would like you can give to those aspirants who have given multiple attempts but is failing at different levels, prelims, multiple prelims or multiple means even interview. What would you like to tell to those aspirants who are uh, no, given multiple attempts and have failed? 
uh, I won't ever romanticize failure in any manner because I know that failure is tough and I've dealt with that. But I would say that if one believes that after any kind of failure, there is any scope for improvement, one should take that. Because that is something which determines whether you need to go for an extra attempt or whether you need to stop this journey. If you feel yourself that there is a bit of improvement that you can do, which can enable you to clear this examination and there's a dream that you need to fulfill, then you need to go for the extra attempt. So I think that is what uh, one need to keep in mind because failures are lessons that we need to derive lessons from. So uh, failures are different chapters that we need to derive lessons from. So I think um, failures are part of life and that goes the same for UPSC as well. And when it comes to UPSC, we know that failures can be tough, but at the same time, we need to have the courage and conviction to move ahead. Well, uh, he has covered it all. There's, <laughs> okay. there's nothing much to add okay. to it. Honestly, uh, see, one thing is that uh, it's a cliche dialogue which I probably often repeat everywhere because this is very close to my heart personally. Uh, it's just one thing that we always hear. Uh, uh, when everything, uh, probably when you feel that, uh, we say, right, uh, what, how, I used to say it every time and now that... <laughs> It's not uh, probably the end. Yeah, it's never the end actually. Uh, you so, know, uh, if it is all right and if you feel that this is the end, uh, it's not actually. The life still goes on and as they say in Hindi, right, picture abhi, abhi bhi baaki hai. So just keep going and wishing and just have a feeling that there is some light at the end of the tunnel and just keep working towards it. Sooner or later your efforts are going to be rewarded one way or the other. And uh, there are people with you to support throughout that journey. And uh, everything is okay at the end. If it's not, it's not the end. That's Great, great advice. Now, what will you advise to those aspirants who have just began the journey, especially those who are taking, you know, their coaching now, they are mainly, they would be facing time crunch, they are confused whether to read newspapers, NCRT is optional, no, they are, you know, you also have gone through that phase, first year of preparation where you don't know what to do, what not to do. To those aspirants, what will you suggest or those who are planning to take attempt in future what would you advise firstly we need to understand the demand of these this examination because there is a trend in the society wherein it is uh, it is a perception that we need to study each and everything under the sun when it comes to upc examination but that is not the case so we need to understand the demand that is the first thing secondly there should be a clear timetable for each day because the problem is if you don't have a timetable you read a lot of things and you feel that you have done a lot of things on one single day but you may not have covered many things, you just uh, remained in one topic. So you need to have a clear timetable so that you can complete the syllabus on time. And thirdly, you need to have a credible set of mentors whom you can rely upon. Uh, in this online era, this is something that is very feasible uh, because there are YouTube videos or guidance which are available online, which is freely accessible as well. But if you are going for some institute, go for a credible institute which can offer you good mentorship support. And uh, fourthly, um, answer writing. Um, even if you are two or three months into the preparation, I would say that you need to go ahead with answer writing. So these are the few things that I need to tell the aspirants. Anything to add? Yes. Uh, the only thing to add is that uh, when you are starting with the preparation, there will be many things in your head running, whether to make notes, whether to do this, uh, reno, uh, uh, read three newspapers, read Kurukshetra, Yojana, Frontline magazines. There will be several things that is going to coming at you in the initial stages. You will have classes from probably nine to four or rather you'll have three or four hours of going into the class and you'll hardly have two to three hours to preparation. So everything at the weekend will look like things are piling up on and you suddenly seem to uh, be lost. And then there'll be people around you whom you're studying where they might be if you knowing a few concepts better than you and you're still sitting in the class where you are wondering, okay, what's going on? So you will feel a lot more demotivated. But this is where the, uh, you know, uh, the saying as he's a fan of such and I'm a fan of MS Dhoni. Uh, there's a famous thing which he always says, trust the process. This is a process where you have to always trust that particular game, which is a long-term thing. Every day is a work in progress. You are also a work in progress. So you will get better by every day and at the end of it, you will reach that goal. And that's it. A really great advice. I hope it reaches out to many aspirants who are preparing. Now my last question is like whenever we start the preparation journey, there would be thought process in our mind that one day I'll become an IS officer. For you, it's an IFS officer this is what I want to do. Like, have you ever thought of that day? Obviously, you're going to for the training and then you will become, you know, for you it's IS and this year I think you will be getting IRS and probably in the coming years into IFS. So, what would you like to do as an IS officer in the future? Uh, I hail from a small town called as Irinjala Kodai, it's in Trishu district. 
Um, so I haven't met a lot of civil servants when I'm a child, but I've heard of them. Uh, and I have visited several government offices as well. So after all these experiences, what I feel is that my only dream when I become a civil servant, if, for that matter, an IAS officer is that anyone who visits my office returns from my office with dignity. That is the only thing that I dream of because I don't have any kind of projects or any kind of innovation uh, in my mind at this point of time. Obviously, I would like to work on social sectors. So that is my area that I would like to focus on. But this is the principle that I would like to keep in mind. Really great. And what about you, Sri Kumar, as an IS, IFS officer, have you ever thought what all would you like to do and all? Uh, I, lived 13, I lived around 12 to 13 years abroad in, in the Middle Eastern state. So I've seen the plight of migrant workers in the Middle East. And my dad was also one of them who reached uh, Gulf countries at a very young age. Uh, so my fascination towards Indian Foreign Service was not only my fascination towards uh, international relations, it was also uh, the difficulties that many of the Indians face abroad. So as an ambassador or as an Indian Foreign Service officer, you also have to have a humane face where you become a spokesperson for your country, for these people and become a channel or become a bridge to have better relations not only with those countries' uh, top political spectrum but also with the common man who is working for India and for Indians abroad India. So this is also uh, be a better host and make those countries their second home that's it really great i mean uh, the best way to end the whole interview like your words your thought process the way you analyze things itself reflect how mature you both are as aspirants and how you're going to reflect that in future as officers so all the very best and we eagerly waiting to see both of you on ground doing tremendous credible you know work uh, uplifting and you know making the new India as we all wish. So once again congratulations Thank and you. really Thank happy you. to be part of your uh, success journey and all the very best. Thank, Thank you. Thank you a lot.